So welcome to the 10th lecture in our series on prosody. We've talked so far quite a bit about the production and perception of prosody, and now we're going to start looking at its role in language and language understanding. So you might imagine um, setting up or inventing a new language, and maybe we can think a bit about how prosody might take a role in identifying and distinguishing the different units of the language. Um, what sort of role it might play in distinguishing different phonemes from each other, or bringing out the meaning in morphemes at different levels, uh, syllabic or lexical. So we'll start at the phoneme level and work our way up to the word level in this recording. So when we're looking at identifying phonemes, there are a number of factors that are involved, and of the different types of prosodic cues that we've looked at, one of the most significant is that of duration. And we can see changes in duration that distinguish between phonemes in long and short vowels. Here are a couple of examples from Japanese. Oji-san, oji-san. In the first case, the word means uncle, and this is distinguished from grandfather just by the duration of the E vowel. We can also have contrasts in, between single and geminate consonants, as in these examples. Oto, oto, kako, kako. Here, distinguishing between sound and husband, and between past and parentheses. So, duration is one cue that distinguishes phonemes, um, what about some of the other prosodic cues that we have? Uh, well, some languages actually do use phonation, specifically voice quality, so those contrasts that we talked about between breathy, creaky, and modal voicing in terms of distinguishing phonemes, um, though that's relatively infrequent in the world's languages. Um, in terms of other cues we looked at, so things like loudness at pitch height are very sensitive to things like microprosodic variation, and so they wouldn't be very reliable phoneme cues. And it can be difficult to express a full pitch slope on something as small as a single phoneme. However, if we move up to longer spans and we look at distinguishing between syllables, um, this is often done in the realm of tone languages, of uh, which Mandarin Chinese is often used as kind of the canonical example. And in these languages, you have a, may have a single syllable here the, with the two phonemes, m and a, ah, and it can take on multiple different tones. And those tones cre uh, create distinctions in meaning, as here. Ma, 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 ma. So those are the four main tones in Mandarin, and canonically we describe those tones based on their pitch. And that can be shown graphically here, with the first tone being high, the tone two being mid-rising, tone three being low dipping and then rising, and tone four is high falling. It's also described periodically in terms of numbers between 5 and 1, where 5 is the top of a speaker's pitch range and 1 is the bottom of their pitch range, and so you can use numeric sequences to describe those contours. However, it's worth noting that pitch, while often used as the primary descriptor for tone in this language, is not the only prosodic element. So tone 3, you may have heard in the earlier recording, had a bit of creaky voice. It's usually low in a speaker's range, and so creak is often associated with tone three. Uh, factors like duration and loudness are also often correlated with these changes in the pitch contour and associated with the tone that way. Now, so this carries a lot of information for words in Mandarin and can help distinguish when you have a fairly small syllabic inventory. Uh, Mandarin Chinese is often described as having tone carrying as much functional load or information content as vowel distinctions. Ma, 
马马马。So we can hear in those contexts that many of these prosodic cues can be used to identify syllables. So pitch height is used, pitch slope and its contour are used. There are durational contrasts and also phonation contrasts. And we can see this described in the IPA. If we look in the bottom corner over here, there's a standard marking、uh, framework where the vertical bar in these labels, tone labels, refers to or essentially references the speaker's pitch range. And so a high bar would refer to a high pitch. Something like middle bar on that would be mid pitch, and similarly, you can describe contours again with reference to the speaker's overall pitch range. That's there. Now, Mandarin has four sort of canonical tones and the so-called neutral tone, which is generally contextually defined. But how many tones might other languages have? So here we have an example from Lao, which is a West Papuan language, and here we have an eight-way contrast. For example, on the phone sequence, B, it marked by B and E, and those are sort of stereotypical semantic differences. So they make height and contour distinctions, and with the syllable ba, we see not just the sort of Semantic distinctions, but maybe more grammatical functions. So, many languages use tone sort of morphologically as a way of marking、uh, taste distinctions or gender distinctions or negation. When we go now up from the syllable level to the level of words, we again see the role of prosody in making these. Sort of minimal pair distinctions. Here we have an example from Japanese. Niji, niji. And here again, we're using pitch contrast. If you listen to it, to distinguish between the words rainbow and two o'clock. Niji, niji. So can you hear the pitch contrasts there? What we're getting. Is the contrast between a low tone followed by a high, and a high followed by a low, and this provides sort of a minimal pair here.、Um, it might just be written not just with these high and low targets, because what we're most interested in is the rise or drop,、um, but with this sort of bracketed notation. Indicating, for example, in the second case, that there is a drop down in pitch.、Um, the contrast in the sort of functional low level in Japanese is not as great as it is in Mandarin, so there aren't as many of these sort of minimal pairs. But it's still important for the language and for the distinctions we're making. Now. Other ways in which words can use sort of prosodic cues to distinct for distinction show up in so-called stress languages.、Um, English is a kind of canonical stress language, and we have an example here where stress is used to distinguish word meaning. Please read our code of conduct and conduct yourself accordingly. So the C O N D U C T sequence appears twice here. And once as a noun in the form, former case, and once as a verb, and that con that contrast is established by the change in stress from being on the first to being on the second syllable. Marked here, and there are a number of ways we can mark this、uh, with high or low. Here we're not. So much specifying particular pitch targets as stronger versus weaker syllables, but those strong syllables are often associated with higher pitch and a number of other prosodic cues,、um, especially increases in duration, stronger articulation,、um, whereas the unstressed syllables are often reduced, not articulated as clearly, 
and also associated with shorter duration and uh, reduced vowel pronunciations. This stress can be marked in a variety of ways. Here we're using an accent. Um, in sort of standard IPA, we mark stress with a primary stress. English has a single primary stress per word when syllable is stressed, but maybe have multiple secondary stresses, primary stress here as in phonetician, so the t is stressed there, and the secondary stress is on the first syllable. Since there are only one stressed and one unstressed syllable in conduct and conduct, they have the top level tick. And there, as I mentioned before, have is an ensemble of these sorts of cues as indicators of stress. Um, generally, duration may be the most salient cue, often higher pitch, uh, possibly louder and more clearly enunciated. English is not the only stress language. There are many stress languages and they follow different patterns. In the case here, we have an example in Spanish where stress is primarily marked by pitch. But for example, if you are a non-native speaker whose first language is English, you might well add more duration and end up with a less natural sounding pronunciation as in this first case. Para llevar, por favor. Contrasted with this example. Para llevar, por favor. Where pitch is the much more salient cue. Spanish generally has relatively regular stress patterns um, in vowel final words. Stress usually falls on the penultimate or second to last syllable. And in orthography, a stress is marked if pitch appears, if the stress actually appears on a different syllable, as here. Papa, papa. So many languages have varyingly consistent uh, rules for positioning stress. In French, generally, stress is word final. In Finnish, stress is canonically word initial. Um, but the combination of different positions for stress within the word and also different ways of realizing stress uh, by using different prosodic cues yields uh, quite a wide range of apparent rhythms in speech. So in sum, prosody can mark many unit levels in speech from phonemes to syllables to words using a whole range of prosody properties and some of this work and some that is done by prosody is structured into tone but also manifests in frameworks that we refer to as stress patterns. But prosody also works at sort of higher level units or longer spans and we'll see how it is manipulated to structure and organize and carry meaning in phrases, utterance, turns, and so on. So we've now seen a bit of tone and stress working from the phone level up to the word level. And in our next lecture, we'll look at the way that prosody works to sequence and connect larger units in speech. Thank you.